There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. Goodness, first question I come up to is, did you date Lars before you got married? <laughs> oh. Yes. But while you're doing that, quickly tell him how we met, because I've had so many people ask him. Okay, this person asks for an explanation. So what I need to, where I need to start is with husband number two, who was dying of cancer, and at the time he was at home, in the last few months, and uh, I needed some help. He got to the point where he was totally helpless, and I couldn't handle him all by myself, so I tried to get a seminary student to come and live in my house to help me take care of him. And the young man who applied for the job was to move in on the following Monday. His name was Walt, and the following Monday, my husband died. So Walt naturally assumed that he wasn't going to be needed, but I thought, why not have a couple of seminary students live in the house? And so I called Walt and told him the room was still available, even though I wasn't going to need his help. And he accepted, and he moved in, and I called the seminary, and I said, I have another room for a male seminary student if you have somebody looking for a place in a private home. And they said, well, there was a man in here just a few minutes ago. We'll send him down. So the long and the short of it is that God really chose two angels to send to me, to live in my house for those first two years after my husband died. They were just star boarders. And lodger number one, Walt, is now my son-in-law. And lodger number two is now my husband. <laughs> so when you, the question is, did you date Lars? Well, Lars and Walt used to take me out together. I mean, the three of us... <laughs> went out quite often for a meal or a movie or something like that because I was, actually, I was feeding them breakfast and dinner every day, not lunch. They ate at the seminary, but um, since I was feeding them, they every once in a while they would feed me. Well, it became obvious to me right after, by the end of the first year, that Lars, is, Lars had a certain interest in me, which was really not very appropriate for a lodger in his landlady. But I was Mrs. Leach to him. He never called me Elizabeth, and Walt never called me Elizabeth. I was Mrs. Leach. And uh, I figured, Lars does not know that I am aware of this, because he was a perfect gentleman, and there had never been, by so much as the flicker of an eyelash, anything that passed between us. And the last thing in the world that I was thinking of was ever getting married a third time, let alone marrying a seminary student, let alone marrying a lodger that was living in my house. And I was telling him, to please clean his dresser off and writing in the dust on the top of it sometimes. And, you know, I was really telling them what to do. And my it was my house. But um, by the end of the second year, I knew that he knew that I knew. <laughs> and so I kicked him out. I just said, you're going to have to find another place to live. And I absolutely refused to get in any kind of an explanation. I thought, if this guy's not smart enough to figure it out by himself, that's too bad. But I am certainly not going to talk about it. Just find another place, which he did. And he then kept coming back and would sometimes bring me a little gift or something and occasionally would take me out to dinner. So you would, the answer is yes, I did, if you call that a date. And it was... I, I thought, and here is his, one of these cases, where I could have sworn that he couldn't really be very serious. I knew he was interested in me as more than a landlady, but I thought he can't possibly think that I would ever marry him or anybody else. He can't possibly think that. And I certainly was not going to entertain any such ideas. So everything that I've said this morning, you can say this pulls the rug out from under it, but... Um, <laughs> From my own experience, I think that my counsel is still wise counsel. But finally, after two more years of really careful, majestic speed, deliberate instancy, he did woo me and win me. 
Did you ask the friend to pray for for your first husband by his name, or was it just a partner in marriage? By his name, most emphatically. This dear Canadian mom of mine was an intimate confidant, and I described Jim Elliot and told her his name in, in intimate detail. But I don't think that's very important if there's some reason why you don't want the person to know the name. But I'm talking about spiritual mothers and fathers who can pray with you and and really enter deeply into your needs and your feelings. I understand that God wants our best, our fulfillment, but he also wants his kingdom to come in the world. Are these two always consistent? Yes. There is no question that God's best for me is God's best for the kingdom. God's best for the kingdom is God's best for me. But we need to remember both things when we pray. And the the kingdom comes first in the Lord's Prayer, doesn't it? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And that is a tremendous all-inclusive prayer. And I'm using it more and more as I get older. The more complicated life becomes and the more prayer requests come to my desk and the less I know about the people that are asking me to pray, the more appropriate it seems to me to pray those great prayers that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come. In other words, everything that's involved in your will, Lord, in its working out in this world, whether it's Eastern Europe or in this particular individual who lives next door or in me, is something to do with your kingdom. So your kingdom come, Lord, thy will be done. And when I pray for a particular thing that has to do with me or with somebody that I love, I have to remember that God has an awful lot of things to think about besides my needs and that person's needs. He is engineering a universe. And so I pray both those prayers, trying to keep in mind that this tiny request of mine is one tiny piece in the great pattern that God is working out. It's not going to get lost because God is omnipotent. But at the same time, it must be harmonized with the purposes of the kingdom. If a person is pursuing missions, would you agree it is easier for a woman to go as a single It seems on the mission field that often her time is absorbed in maintenance of the family instead of evangelism. I think it's, if it's possible, it's certainly better to go as to go out as a single. And what I did, I went out as a single. I was not engaged and had no commitment at all when I went to the mission field. And it does give you the freedom to learn the language. And I've seen far too many missionary wives who never get around to learning the language because they get so bogged down trying to keep house without the conveniences that they're used to and it's, it just never happens. And as those of you know who read Passion and Purity, when Jim proposed to me, he made that very stringent condition. And he didn't propose to me till after we had both been jungle missionaries on our own, I on the western side of the Andes and Jim on the eastern side. And when he proposed, he said, I, I want you to marry me, but I will not marry you until you learn Quechua. And I had already had to learn Spanish and had been working all that year on Colorado, which is an Indian language of the Western jungle and has absolutely no relationship to Quechua any more than Greek and English. Any more than Greek and Chinese, let's say. There's some connection between Greek and English, but there wasn't any between Quechua and Colorado. So, yes, it, it's easier to go out single and get that huge hurdle over get over that big hurdle of language before you get married, but that doesn't rule out the possibility of being married. And when I was married, I felt that my ministry was only enhanced. It wasn't limited in any way because Jim and I were working together on the reduction to writing of the Quechua language. We worked together on the translation of the book of Luke, and we had just finished that in first draft when Jim was killed. And my all of my work was in my home, and, and our home was was our work. I mean, the Indians came in and out of our home as freely as we went in and out of theirs. Where is the line drawn concerning male-female friendships which involve non-Christians and Christians? I don't think that it makes any sense at all for Christians to date non-Christians because you are simply asking for trouble. As for friendships... I would say the same thing that I say about male-female friendships when it's a one-to-one thing. Avoid them. Don't kid yourself. 
don't get into one-to-one -one relationships. Anything where that word relationship occurs in your consciousness means that you're already in trouble the minute you start using that word relationship. And I said this morning, we never used that. And I think we avoided all kinds of problems that way. But can you imagine Paul, for example, talking about a special relationship that he had with Phoebe? The fact that Phoebe was a deaconess and had helped Paul in some of his labors does not mean that they had some kind of a relationship that they could have talked about to other people. I have this wonderful relationship, this really neat relationship with Paul. I mean, she was a sister, but all the Galatian Christians were his brothers and sisters. All the Ephesian Christians were his brothers and sisters. So I could go on for a couple more hours on this subject again because I think that I left a lot of things unsaid simply because of the limitations of time. But I, I think that one of the bad things about the book that my husband mentioned, Dating with Integrity, is that his whole thesis is based on brother-sister relationships. And that is a confusion. That is a very valid description of a spiritual relationship. We are all brothers and sisters. I don't know anybody in this room very well, but if we ever meet again, I would certainly regard you as a brother or a sister in Christ, and we would have something in common that we'd been here. But I don't have a special relationship with anybody here. I might have a special friend who is a woman, but I think it's a very dangerous business to have special friends, no matter what you want to call them, of the opposite sex. As soon as they're special, as soon as you use the word relationship, you're in trouble. So I would say that applies to Christians or non-Christians. I went out for supper with a non-Christian and explained the gospel clearly to him. Now, where do I draw the line concerning what I do with him on a friendship level? Turn him over to a male friend. Just say, look, here's a guy who might be interested in the gospel over to you. In response to Lars's question, tabled at this morning's meeting, I think that's what it says here, I believe that it is healthy for Christian men and women to pursue meaningful platonic relationships if, A, they are mature in their biblical understanding about holy relating. I don't find anything about holy relating in the Bible. That word doesn't occur. B, they have communicated the parameters of what they can and cannot discuss. Now, that sounds to me like a very complicated business. I wouldn't want to get into it. C, they understand where they stand with each other. Do they? Do you think this is fallacious? And if so, please defend it with scripture. I haven't defended it at all. I can't. So we'll leave it at that. How would you advise a woman in dealing with a... I'm not going to get into that question right now. I'm going to skip that one if I can get, a, get away with it. <laughs> when my time runs up, I quit. I'm just reading these as they come here, except for the ones that are almost unanswerable. How can one trust God's prompting that a certain person is to be his, her mate when determining God's will is sometimes so subjective? It sounded this morning as if you believe two people don't need to know each other at all before making the commitment of marriage. I met a man. Well, I guess she, this is crossed out, that part. I can only reiterate what I said, that almost all the marriages in almost all of human history and almost all societies have been between people who did not know each other. They had no conversations at all. And there was an Indian young man here this morning who came up to me and said that this is exactly the way his parents got married. They never saw each other until the wedding day. Now, the great advantage to this is that they have to choose then to love. It has nothing to do with feelings. And although we would be very unrealistic to think that we can go back to that in the United States, I'm giving you what seems to me a reasonable pattern that might be substantiated from Scripture. And I don't think you can find any substantiation from Scripture of the pattern that has been followed in the last 50 years, let's say. Romantic love is a very recent concept in human history. By recent, I mean it never occurred to anybody until the Middle Ages. There was no such thing. And it was only in the Middle Ages when they spoke about courtliness and romantic love, it was between a knight and a lady to whom he was not married. So it's not a good pattern for us. But the whole idea of falling in love is, is a very, very recent origin. 
So I'm saying, yes, I do believe that it is entirely possible for two people to choose to love each other in obedience to God. I acknowledge the difficulty of discerning the will of God, and that's where faith comes in. Does God mean his promises when he says he will guide us? But we're talking always on the assumption that this is all solidly founded on prayer and waiting. And I would urge you to study Psalm 37. Delight yourself in the Lord. Trust in him. Wait on him. I cannot emphasize those sufficiently. So don't go tearing out of here and barging into some outrageous proposal or relationship or whatever you want to call it without those preconditions with the counseling that I strongly urged. Can you give some examples of what it means to take up your cross? Yes, a very simple little thing. As a wife, there are things probably not quite every day, but three or four or five times a week, where I have to give in to some very slight preference of Lars's, perhaps. And this has nothing to do with any kind of conflict between us. It's just that when two people walk together, they have to be agreed. So if they happen to disagree on something, one of them has to give in. Well, I happen to know that the scripture, scriptural pattern is that the buck stops with Lars. So if he makes a wrong decision, God's not going to charge me with making the wrong decision or with not persuading Lars to do otherwise, although I can tell him if I think he's making a mistake. God is going to hold him responsible. He is my protector. And it is my safest place to accept his headship. So that's a very small area. It's the willingness to say yes to God and no to myself. As my friend Carolyn mentioned in her phone call this morning, she wanted to be here. But God was saying no. And so she says, yes, Lord, I'll take it. You know, it's just in, it's in a thousand little things, as Paul was talking about in the passage I read just this evening. Every day we experience these perplexities. We are perplexed but not in despair. Uh, we are forsaken, but we are cast down but not forsaken. Uh, in any way in which you're cast down, are you willing to say yes to God and to receive this as just part of the breaks? If Lars and I miss a connection when we're traveling, it's upsetting, isn't it, to our nature? But I'm not at the mercy of TWA. I'm not at the mercy of the weather. I am in the hands of God. Underneath are the everlasting arms. So I accept that. Lars got us on the wrong plane one night which meant that we not only missed the last flight to Boston on which our luggage was, but we had to, we, there were no other flights on, on any other air carrier, and so we had to go and stay in a hotel in Chicago with no luggage at all. Now that kind of thing cuts across my natural desires. <laughs> and I could have torn into Lars about that stupidity of getting us on the wrong plane. Will you share with us how God brought your husbands to you and how you watched him work his holy harmony and use you with, as you waited on him? I met Jim, of course, as a college student, and I met my second husband through a speaking engagement. I spoke, I was invited to speak at a small college in Missouri, of which he was vice president. And at that time, he was still married to his first wife, who was dying of cancer. And she died the following year, and the year after that, he married me and how you watched him work his holy harmony in you as you waited on him. In my book, Passion and Purity, I've spelled out in very intimate detail the hard lessons of waiting on God when your desire is so powerful. And one of the things that Jim and I were very aware of that very first day that we had our first conversation about how we felt was that our feelings were really like a tornado. And it would be ridiculous for us to imagine that we could control them by ourselves. And so we just turned them over to God and decided we would not touch each other because it was too dangerous. And so we would let God bring us together, which he did in his own way. And you can read the book. 
you want to know the details on that. How affectionate in a relationship can you be? For example, holding hands, kissing, putting an arm around each other. Paul says it is good for a man not to touch a woman. My mother said keep them at arm's length. That's good advice. Now, I'm not saying it's a sin to hold hands, but what I would like to ask anybody that challenges me on that, Jim and I decided we would not even hold hands until we were engaged and we were never we never kissed until we were engaged. Anybody that wants to argue, I would say, "Okay, do you know exactly where to draw the line in such a way as to be an absolute guarantee that you won't go too far?" How many stories have we all heard? about the girl that got pregnant when she didn't mean to. Well, I don't know how it happened, you know. Well, it happens the same way every time. <laughs> so, take what Paul says. It is good for a man not to touch a woman, but he says if the man is burning and if because of the wickedness in the world there is a lot of temptation, then get married. So Paul is making a clear distinction between either being unmarried or being married there is no middle ground in scripture there is nothing except betrothal now betrothal was as serious as marriage you know that Mar mary and joseph were betrothed when the angel told mary that she was going to bear the son of of god and you remember that joseph had already taken responsibility for that woman because it says joseph being a righteous man an upright man and not wanting to put her to shame was going to put her away secretly. He was not going to marry this woman because he had, he didn't know that this was a miraculous virgin birth until the angel came and told him. And so the angel told him, "Don't be afraid to take her. She has not been unfaithful to you. That holy thing is conceived by the Holy Ghost." And so there's the pattern. There is such a thing as betrothal, but it is as serious. It's not a trial period. It is a promise made before God and then the time comes when you make it before the public so to to Jim and me it was a very very serious thing to touch each other and to kiss because we knew our own nature well enough to know that those things happen to be exciting it's not exciting to kiss your grandmother and it's not very exciting to shake hands with a preacher when you go out of church but if you're honest with yourself you know perfectly well that the lightest touch from a member of the opposite sex in a dark place is very exciting. Don't lie to yourself or to anybody else about that. It was God's design that a touch should lead to a handhold and a handhold to a squeeze and a squeeze to a hug and a hug to a kiss and a kiss to another kind of a kiss. And you know what I'm talking about. And then what? So why 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 why? Do people want to play around the edge of the precipice? Why would I give anybody the right to touch this body that is not mine? I am not my own. I am bought with a price. Nobody has a right to touch this body unless I give them permission. I'm going to leave it at that right now. Who knows how many more questions are going to come up about this? What are particular ways you develop a close relationship with God? Prayer, Bible study, and obedience. Prayer, Bible study, and obedience. You can't pray intelligently without Bible study. You can't read your Bible intelligently without prayer. Both prayer and Bible study become meaningless unless you do what he says. In John 14, Jesus said, if you love me, do what I say. Let me get that exact verse for you here. Because he goes on to, sh to show that this is the way in which you get to know God through obedience. Um, if you read John 14, 15, if you really love me, you will keep the commandments I have given you, and I shall ask the Father to give you someone else to stand by you. And then down, further down, and again, I'm using a translation that doesn't have the verses marked. Every man who knows my commandments and obeys them is the man who really loves me. And every man who really loves me will himself be loved by my Father, 
and I too will love him and make myself known to him. So it is obedience that is the opener of my spiritual eyes. The knowledge of God is not an intellectual exercise. It is the reward of humble obedience. And to go back to the whole question of how well you have to know somebody before you marry them, it's by loving somebody that you get to know them. In the two years that Lars lived in my house, I learned a lot of things about Lars and about his character. But the only way that I've learned to know him is by loving him. And I didn't really love him until a long time after he moved out of my house. So it's the same way with God. If you really want to learn to know him, then you've got to love him. And loving him means obedience. Was it ever difficult for you to to not be aggressive towards your husband's-to-be before marriage? Yes, it was difficult. I am a very aggressive woman. I was not born with one atom of submissiveness. (laughs) What did you say? I'm afraid that's true. Not not quite every time, but (laughs) I was never tempted to be aggressive with Lars. Not at all, because I mean, maybe I never had to be because I never had the slightest desire. I mean, I have to tell the whole world this that I did not have the slightest desire to get married at all, let alone to get married to this man who was just a lodger in my house. So I was not (laughs) tempted to be aggressive. With him, but, uh, and I, in the sense of needing to be aggressive with either of the other two, I didn't because they were extremely aggressive men themselves and I did have to beat them off with a two by four. (laughs) But I did beat them off. If so, what helped you through? Well, the grace of God, that's the answer to practically everything. In asking God why, two marriageable people, there's a chapter called Two Marriageable People in my book. You know, on asking God why. You say, if a man knows a woman is the right one to pray for God's timing, if she tells him get lost, what is the reasoning? Well, a man can be mistaken. C.T. Studd believed that God had shown him the wife, the wife, the woman that he was to marry, and so he went to her and told her that God had shown him that she was the wife for him and she said well it's funny that God hasn't told me anything about it and he said well God has told me so what you need to do is get down on your knees and pray until you find out that it's God's will and she did pray and she found out that it was God's will and they got married (laughs) does Jesus find it all right to date on a long-term basis ask Jesus Long term. What is this long term thing? How long does it take a man to make up his feeble mind? I mean, really, I don't understand it. When I had seen Jim Elliott on the other side of the campus and watched him in about three Greek classes and seen him up as the president of the Foreign Missions Fellowship and gone to one wrestling match, Long before all that was accomplished, I had made up my mind, if God would ever give me a man half as good as Jim Elliott, I'd grab him. I mean, I did not have one conversation with Jim. I I only had one date with Jim, which was to go to Moody Church to hear a missionary speak. We went on the train, and Jim paid for the tickets going and coming. He did not buy me so much as a Coke. He didn't have the money. So that was the date. It was a missionary meeting. But that's all. I mean, I didn't, there wasn't anything important that I could have learned by intimacy. I don't know how to emphasize this more strongly. Is there anybody here with gray hair that agrees with me? Would you put up a hand? (laughs) Thank you. I've noticed how you have an ability to tell the truth in love. Thank you so much. Not everybody thinks that. (laughs) And I was wondering how to respond when a very sensitive person comes to you needing to unload and talks bad about someone (laughs) 
Well, sometimes, uh, ta- I don't know what they mean by talking bad, uh, to tell another person's faults, generally speaking, is not a good idea, is it? We, we love covers faults. But then there are some occasions when it is necessary. It may not be kind, it may not be the ideal thing to do, but it is necessary to discuss somebody else's faults, and I don't know what's behind this question. Uh, in that case, you do need to listen sympathetically and to certainly keep your mouth shut and, and keep the confidence. If it's really talking in a wrong way about someone, then I think we need to be faithful to that person and, and just tell them that, that you don't really want to listen to that sort of thing. If a woman is in love with a man and he's never told her he feels the same, should she break off the friendship? It hurts bad and there is no answer in sight. I think that there does come a time when it's it's not only merely a waste of time, it is a waste of time, but it's also too much of an emotional drain to continue. And what is the point? Again, I go back to the fact that once we reach marriageable age, we ought to be moving toward marriage, unless God has made it very plain to you that you're to remain celibate. So I'm talking to you men right now. If you think God has given you the gift of celibacy, then there's no reason in the world why you would ever date. That would make no sense to me whatsoever. But if you do think that possibly God wants you to get married, then I'm not saying that it's sinful for you to date. I'm simply giving, I have given you an alternative pattern to that. But this, I presume, is written by a woman. And she is in love with a man, and he's never told her he feels the same. And I would certainly break off the friendship after a point now with in the story of Jim Elliot which you can read in detail it was a very unusual situation and it's not one that I would ever recommend my father told my four brothers do not ever tell a woman you love her until you're ready to follow that declaration immediately with the question will you marry me you have no business telling her you love her until you're ready to say will you marry me just keep it to yourself and you have absolutely no business asking her how she feels And as Lars always tells women who ask him this question, um, what shall I say when a man asks me intimate questions? Lars says the answer is, why do you ask? Why do you say it with a nice smile? (laughs) (laughs) My My first husband told me I had a sledgehammer personality. My second husband said, my wife doesn't call a spade a spade. She calls it a bloody shovel. (laughs) And my husband, Lars, being a very gentle man, he just stands over there and does all the smiling for me. (laughs) When was your last contact with the Alka Indians? What changes did you observe? The Alkas are the ones who killed my husband, for those of you that don't, don't know. And I did spend two years with them, living with them, and then went back in 19... Left Ecuador in 63 to come back to the States, but I had been back, I was back to visit the Alcas once in 1976. And about the only changes that I saw at that time were just that they looked much older and much more ragged. You put clothes on people that have never worn clothes before, and they just look an awful mess. You know, they were much more beautiful back in the days when they wore that piece of string. And uh, they have this beautiful iced tea colored skin and they were just perfect bodies, of course, perfectly athletic and, and lean and muscular. And to see them in these rags was just kind of pathetic to me. When I learned enough of their language to ask stupid questions, I said to one of the men, why do you wear that string? And he said, well, you wouldn't expect us to go around naked, would you? <laughs> Would you describe your devotional quiet time with the Lord, please? When, where, average length of time? Now, that is a very personal question, and I'm not going to tell you all the details of that. But uh, generally speaking, I, I, I do kneel. I get up early in the morning because most any reasonable person knows that there isn't going to be any other time of the day that will be uninterrupted, that can be guaranteed to be uninterrupted. So whether you're a morning person or not, I think that's... There's lots of scriptural precedents for that. Jesus got up a great while before day and went out to pray. And the psalmist said, early shall, shall I seek thee, or early in the morning you will hear my voice. So that's a good principle. 
for all of us. Would you just, let's see. Um, I find it a good idea for me to kneel, partly because it's an uncomfortable position and I'm not likely to go to sleep on, on my knees. I also think that there's plenty of scriptural precedent for that, but there's also scriptural precedent for sitting. David sat before the Lord and Samuel stood before the Lord, so whatever you do, but don't be too comfortable. I read my Bible. I have prayer lists. I go systematically through the Bible, and I do keep a spiritual journal. Um, Where is in my study. I have a little small study of my own. Lars has his own office, and he goes into his office, and I go into my study. And as for the average length of time, I don't think I'll give you the answer to that one. Do you think it necessary for a man to have an idea of what his life purpose, vision, etc. is prior to proposing to a woman? Yes, most emphatically. If he hasn't gotten it sorted out that his purpose, what his purpose in life is, then he's very premature in taking on a wife. There was a time when a man wouldn't even think of taking on a wife until he had a job and knew that he could support her. Nowadays, men are taking on wives so that they, so that the wives will support the men. As a woman teaching Bible in a Christian school to young men over age 12, am I usurping spiritual authority? Should men teach only men? Should men only teach men? Well, it's an odd question to be asking me, who I'm standing here talking to a mixed group. But first of all, let me say this is not a church. And Paul's instructions, as I understand them, were given specifically to church order. And women are out of order when they are taking positions of authority in the church. I've taught in a theological seminary, and my classes were almost all men. But I never thought of that as being a violation of the rule because it's not a church, even though it's a group of believers, presumably. Uh, It's not the functioning church which represents, which is the visible sign of the invisible reality of the invisible church. I may be wrong about this. When I do speak in a church on a Sunday evening, for example, and I never speak in Sunday morning church services, but if I speak in a Sunday evening church service, it's always with the understanding that a man must be in charge of the meeting so that I speak under the authority of Christ, under the authority of the word, under the authority of my husband, and under the authority of the man who holds the authority in this church and turns over to me for a limited period of time the pulpit. So I would say certainly not, this woman is not usurping authority by teaching 12-year-old children in a school. What are some keys in developing passion for God? One of the attributes I admire in your husband, Mr. Grin. Well, isn't that nice? Mr. Grin seems to have disappeared. But I'll tell him about that. I th- I'll give you the same answer that I gave to the earlier one in learning to know God and to love God. Obedience is the key. And if you say that you don't really know what God wants you to do, I would contradict that flatly because you always know something God wants you to do. He wants you to uh, love your neighbor and he wants you to do your job and he wants you to be kind to your mother and write that letter or make that apology. You know, there's always a million things that you know very well God wants you to do. And you do that and ask him to show you the next step and he'll show you the next step. If standing on a conviction means that it might possibly move a man to action, is or could that not be considered manipulation by a woman? If standing on a conviction means that it might possibly move a man to action, well, I wish he'd been more, he or she had been more specific in this, but let me guess at a conviction. A woman has a conviction, for example, that she doesn't want the man to touch her. So she's going to stand on this conviction and it's going to move the man to action. That means move him to move away. Uh, It could be considered manipulation by the woman. This word manipulation is overworked. I mean, we all influence people. Am I manipulating you by standing up here and dishing out all this free advice? Well, I don't look at it as manipulation. You can reject it if you want to. And I think that When the feminists talk about women manipulating men and men manipulating women, I think they're really insulting both sexes. I don't think we're quite that stupid. 
we know, I mean, women like to be manipulated by men to a certain degree, and men like to be manipulated by women to a certain degree. If we're doing it deliberately and with a cynical motive, then it's wrong. But if it's merely a matter of persuasion or uh, prodding or influence, I don't see that as being very dangerous. But that's probably not at all what this questioner had in mind. I understand that God wants our best, our fulfillment. Oh, I read that, didn't I? If a person is pursuing missions, here I'm mixing up my piles, I guess. Those are the ones I did read. I have a friend who currently has seven men pursuing her. Each man claiming that God revealed that she should be his wife. How would... Well, that woman has seven times as many options as most women have. How would you respond in this situation? Well, I haven't, never, I haven't had that problem, but I get letters all the time from groups who want me to come and speak, and they have been praying about this for six months, and the Holy Spirit has given them my name. And so on September the 6th, they would like me to come and speak. Well, I get five letters for September the 6th, and the Holy Spirit has told all of them that I'm supposed to be in five different places. You know, how does one respond? You can only say, thank you very much, I'm sorry, I must decline. That's what I would say to the seven men. You pick the one you want if any one of them meets your long list of requirements. Do you believe in divorce in the situation of wife abuse? Just a yes or no, please. If you insist on a yes or a no, then the answer is no. God hates divorce. If you have some reason to think that your case is an exception, then you have to take your case to God and not to Elizabeth Elliot. I I try my best not to say what is not in Scripture. To say what is in scripture, to draw whatever I can from scripture, but it's not my job to spell out the exceptions. How to deal with a family member who goes to a liberal church and has an immoral relationship. That word deal, um, since I don't know the relationship with a family member, if it's a husband, we wives must remember that Uh, We are not our husband's moral custodians. We are there to submit and to be gentle and quiet in spirit. If it's a cousin or a brother or a sister, you, you have to do a lot of praying before you would say anything about this and ask God to give you words to say if he wants you to say something. And very often we do have a spiritual responsibility, whether it's a relative or not. The scripture says, if any of you be overtaken in a fault, those of you who are spiritual should restore such a one, how? In a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. That is a scriptural pattern. But there are times when uh, I can think of an instance in my own family where I know that the person knows exactly what I think and knows exactly what I would say if she gave me the chance to say it, but she has not given me the chance to say it. And I feel as though I would be barging in um, fruitlessly unless God opens the way. And I I pray all the time for this person and, and just say, Lord, if there is something more that I can do than I have already done, please open the door. Make it clear to me what that is. If we go on the principle that God will lead us to a spouse after we've turned that over to him, once God has led us to that person and we've prayed together and agreed that it is his will to be married, how long should the engagement be? Oh, that's a good question. And I think that that, that there's no, unless there's a, a, a practical reason why it should be long, then it shouldn't be long. In Jim's and my case, there were very practical reasons. When, when Jim proposed to me finally in Ecuador after we had both been missionaries for a year, we thought that our engagement might have to last five years. And mind you, we had waited five years already. But Jim had made commitments that he was going to build houses for some other missionaries who didn't know how to build houses. And I thought, 
Well, you'd certainly think that a man that's going to get married would think that the top priority would be building a house for his wife first. But that was not the way Jim looked at it. And he said, look, I've told him I'll build them a house. And he said, I don't know how long it's going to take, so we won't set a date. But he said, in case there's a cataclysmic event which God brings about, I don't see any possibility within five years. And the cataclysmic event took place. The foundations of two houses that Jim had laid were wiped out by a flood and went down the Amazon. And the entire station, including all the boards that Jim had collected for building those houses, went down the Amazon. 500 man days of labor in just the boards that went down the river, not counting all the work of the foundations. So we got married almost immediately after the flood. (laughs) But it was nine months after we got engaged. Um, In the case of a man who is, say, in medical school and has huge debts to pay, I think it's ridiculous to take on the responsibility of a family and insist that your wife is going to have to go to work and help you pay off your debts before you can even think of having children. I don't think you should get married until it's reasonable to consider having children because marriage means fruitfulness. God's command to married people is be fruitful and multiply, and I don't think Christians ought to be postponing that indefinitely. Practical reasons, money, a place to live, schooling, whatever. Otherwise, the shorter, the better. Especially if you're living near each other where the temptation just becomes very, very difficult. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today. And will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms.